Welcome everybody to the 14th webinar of the online edition of the Protein Electrostatic Conference. The speaker of today is uh, uh, Dr. Nicolas Falop from Bernalis in UK. Uh, Nicolas got his PhD from Paris Orsay University in France uh, in biophysics and protein crystallography. Then he did uh, uh, postdocs in the USA at Mount Sinai School of Medicine and Baltimore School of Pharmacy. He worked there in uh, uh, nucleic and acid, nucleic acid, the force field uh, development. Uh, then he did a, a further postdoc at Karolinska Institute, working also on electrostatics and PKA calculation. Finally, in 2001, he joined RiboTargets in Cambridge, UK, which then became Vernalis, where he is now principal scientist. The title of his presentation of today will be Reorganization Energy of Drug Compounds Upon Binding to Proteins some notes about the electrostatics. Okay, thank you, Nicolas, for being here, and go ahead. Oh, thanks a lot, Walter. So first I will try to put my presentation in full screen mode, then try to find the pointer. So, and so, yeah, uh, again, I want to thank uh, Walter for organizing this series of webinars, which have been uh, very educational for me. And of course, I also want to thank uh, the other speakers. We had some wonderful talks, so previous and future speakers. Today, my presentation may be a little bit different because I work in industry. So, and in Advernalis, which is uh, located near Cambridge in the UK. And we are uh, in the business of doing uh, structure-based drug discovery with small molecules. So my presentation will probably be a little bit different in the sense that I'm going to talk about small organic molecules. Um, and in particular, uh, on the question of the reorganization energy of these uh, drug compounds when they bind to proteins. And by drug, I mean generically small organic molecules. Um, and this is, I should say, and this is one my first disclaimer, this is not a hardcore presentation about electrostatics. That's why the title says notes about electrostatics. So I hope this, that there will be some aspects of interest regarding the electrostatics. Um, and so now, also, I really want to thank uh, I -Gen, I -Gen Chen, uh, who has worked a lot uh, with me on this. And I should say, uh, bec you know, we, be because we're in industry, this is work that we can do mostly uh, during the weekends and even evenings. So this is not, I'm not going to summarize um, 20 years of work done in a large lab. This is just a focus story uh, by two people who try to continue to do some basic research while in industry when time allows. And so um, a, a lot of what I'm going to talk about tries to look at the unbound state of compounds, um, because I, as I will explain, this tends to be a little bit neglected, but we think it is important for molecular recognition and to better understand um, uh, a number of aspects when these compounds bind to the receptors. So, and so, so what I'm going to talk about involves indeed a conformational sampling and conformational analysis of small organic molecules. And this is a very old topic in medicinal chemistry, but still, very much of interest. Uh, it is still um, a very relevant topic currently, uh, and I hope I will I will illustrate that a little. Uh, it is nowadays largely computational, um, and and for instance, a kind of so this uh, intervenes in many aspects now of drug discovery, uh, spe especially with small molecules. And for instance, so typically with small molecules, they come as a, I would say as a 2D structure, but we, we would like to uh, use structure, we would like to use three-dimensional structure to improve these compounds. 
especially tr uh, frequently try to predict what we call their bioactive, bioactive structure, which is when the compounds are bound to their target. And this, of course, involves generating conformers. So, um, and so this slide is to try to put things in some kind of broad context. So this conformational analysis and sampling, of course, has many applications, such as generating a binding model for the small molecule and also virtual screening. So there is, of course, a practical utilitarian aspect, um, which is very present in industry. But there are also some fundamental questions related to the physical chemistry of molecular recognition. And today, it is more this uh, latter aspect that I will try to uh, discuss. So, and, and in particular, uh, this presentation will pay attention to the question of what do compounds look like in the unbound state? Um, because in nowadays in industry for many projects we have we frequently have in fact the crystal structure of the compound bound to its target so uh, here i just illustrated on the slide with um, crystals the x-ray density for a compound um, but so we see the bound state, but frequently we, we don't know much, if anything, about the unbound state. So the conformers and their dynamics um, in the unbound state are usually not characterized. And that's because, of course, um, in solution, it, because it is in solution, it is difficult to approach experimentally even in fact by NMR. So th there are a few case studies by NMR but they are rare. Uh, recently, uh, th there's been a renewed interest in that, um, but such studies remain rare and, and are certainly not um, routine. So instead, uh, we try to, we, instead we, we try to fill this gap with computational tools. And there are essentially two broad approaches to do that. One is what we call a ad hoc sampling, where we simply generate uh, we generate a 3D conformation, and then we somehow move the coordinates. And there are many methods to do that, and and then we try to keep diverse conformers. So this is what we call the ad hoc approach. Um, more and which, um, of course, is fundamentally different from a physics based approach, um, such as molecular dynamic simulation in explicit solvent. Um, these physics based approaches are, of course, computationally much more costly uh, and are, are not, um, not very frequently employed still now in industry. So, um, this is why. So, uh, this and this slide is again to continue to give you a little bit of context. Um, and uh, so, so the unbound state uh, is typically frequently simply represented by the global energy minimum for the compound obtained by one of these so-called ad hoc sampling methods. So the principle is very simple. We have some a potential energy surface for the compound, depending on the conformational degrees of freedom. And there are ways to sample this energy surface. Uh, one keeps uh, conformers within a certain energy window. And uh, the, lowest, the lowest energy conformer is called the global energy minimum, or is assumed to be the global energy minimum. Uh, and this um, global energy minimum is frequently kept, is frequently used to represent the unbound state, simply because it is practically convenient, as you can see. It is also computationally tractable, especially if you have many compounds to deal with. And chemical intuition favors, you know, suggests that these low energy conformers could be relevant. But of course, it is simplistic uh, because we we know intellectually or we expect uh, the compounds to exist as populations in the unbound state. So ideally, that's what we would like to use. 
Now, this slide is to remind you a little bit why the unbound state is relevant to molecular recognition uh, with drugs. Um, so, um, and, and the, energ the energetics associated with that, which as chemists or medicinal chemists, we have to try to optimize and improve typically. So, of course, uh, the first thing is that uh, in, in solution, unbound, the unbound compound is thought to exist uh, as a, a broad range of conformers, but um, when upon binding, uh, a lot of conformational freedom is, is usually thought to be lost. And this, of course, incurs an entropy penalty uh, related to this compound ordering upon binding. And one way to improve binding affinities uh, for pharmaceutical compounds is sometimes to try to pre-organize the compounds such that in the unbound state, they, they, would, um, they would be similar to what they look like in the bound state. But to do that well, one needs more than the picture of the bound state. Uh, one also needs to understand ideally the unbound state. Now, another property of interest is what is called, it's a bit of a mouthful, sorry, but it's a compound intramolecular conformational reorganization energy upon binding. So this is now uh, an, 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 energy, an, an intramolecular energy. Um, and it, it, it has been, in fact, difficult to tackle technically. Uh, and uh, Previous studies um, have come up with surprises and contradiction regarding these reorganization energies. And that's what I'm going to try to explain uh, as well today. So to, allow, to, to say a little more about this uh, conformational reorganization energy upon binding, it is, in our work at least, defined strictly as an intramolecular contribution. Um, not everybody agrees with that. Some people lump some solvation terms with that, but we think that it tends to confound things. So uh, we like to keep it as an intramolecular term. Um, it is, of course, a component, only a component of the free energy of binding. But it is relevant to compound design because, because this is one property on which one can try to act to further improve a binding affinity, among many other things, of course. Um, and because it is only a component of the free energy of binding, it is, of course, not directly accessible experimentally. And as I said, uh, we take the view that we, we, we estimate this organization energy without solvation energies or other intermolecular contributions. Otherwise, it, we think it gets tricky to separate things. So um, this is here a little diagram which tries to summarize that schematically. It's again, in principle, quite very simple. It's straightforward, the compound, let's say as a conformation in the unbound state, we transfer that in, in vacuo. Then we change the conformation from unbound to bound. And then, uh, then, then uh, this is a conformational change that we are interested in. And the, the reorganization energy is simply the conformational energy difference between these two uh, states. So that looks very simple and straightforward, but it's in fact very, it's deceptively simple uh, for a number of reasons. One of course is that we cannot just calculate conformational energies on uh, the X-ray structure of the bound state. Uh, so then, you know, what do you use? And frequently we do not know, uh, as I said, what is a conformation in the unbound state. So, Conformational energies have been elusive for both the, the bound and unbound states, in, and which makes this organization energies, in fact, very tricky to approach. Oh, I should say, yeah, so this slide is, um, is to say that one can define the reorganization energies or free energies. Excuse me, uh, Nicolas. 
May yes. I ask you, sorry, yes. just, just to, to understand uh, clearly, why you say, so what are the reasons of the uncertainty when you are talking about the bound state in case you have the crystal? Yes. You mean the force field or, or which are the other? Partly, um, yes. Okay, now, um, so, I uh, yeah, coming, coming back to this slide, um, it, so, uh, of course, you cannot just calculate an energy directly on a crystal structure, right? Because uh, there would be uh, crystal structures are not refined in terms of the force field. So, you, if you calculate, so th there will be mismatches between, for instance, small differences in bond lengths, valence angles. So if you calculate an energy directly on a crystal structure, you will get huge energies with a force field and as well as with a quantum mechanical method. Um, so some kind of minimizations will, would need to be done, but this can be quite tricky in fact, because you st if you start minimizing a compound in a binding site, things do not always go well. Um, and, uh, so this is where so you run into trouble um, because you know, the minimization may take you too far away from the crystal structure, for instance. So some kind of balance needs to be struck between uh, maintaining the, the experimental information and relaxing uh, your conformer so that you can obtain a relevant energy um, does that i don't know if that does that explain does that help yes yes thanks okay so, uh, quick question so yeah I, I understand what you said and i i completely agree but it's the, the way we've done it and i think other people is you just keep the dihedral angles fixed and you optimize everything else right that's people have tried that, and uh, it sounds it sounds as it, as if it would work. But if you so, uh, I will show you that previous studies came up with quite um, surprising results with in general, even when using that. And in fact, doing that also also. It, it, tends to give you conformers which do not which depart a lot more from the crystal structure than you would expect. So this is not um, automatically a good recipe, but um, so mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but it's it's a good point because that's exactly what one th that you you would think that this would work well. Uh, in practice, in our hands and other in other people's experience as well, it does not work so well. But maybe you have a different experience. Um, it will be interesting to learn from you at the end on that. So yeah, the, I'm moving on to the next slide, which was just to say that one can define these reorganization energies uh, fairly, I mean, somewhat rigorously as part of a thermodynamic cycle. And I, I don't particularly want to dwell on that. But they, they, are, they are defined properties. That, that's what I wanted to say. So, uh, and before I, so this is maybe my last background slide, but I just wanted to recapitulate a little bit on prior studies on that, um, which I should say are all studies that we respect and love and uh, they're all good studies, uh, but, um, what so what I'm, I'm showing a timeline here, and I wanted to to I want to show you that these studies uh, came up with um, some of them very large reorganization energy. So, for instance, the first study in '95 by Mark Nicholas uh, found a mean uh, conformational reorganization energy of 16 kcal per mole, which um, got people very worried uh, and because that seems to be very large compared to um, a binding free energy of let's say 12 kcal per mole for a potent a compound with a potency of a, a nanomolar. Um, so uh, so an, another study found a much smaller numbers, but then more recent studies came up again with a very large uh, 
reorganization energies. Uh, and to the point where the, the, one of the most recent studies in 2012, you know, had reorganizations energies of up to 40 kcal per mole or, or even more, in fact, if one reads very carefully. Uh, and this was a very sophisticated study, which in fact did constrain the dihedral angles and used quantum mechanical methods and all kinds of things. Um, but these organization energies looked very surprising and I would say controversial. So indeed, the, the, so there are two points in this controversy. One is the, uh, the magnitude of the reorganization energies, which many people in fact dismiss out of hand and say that they cannot be that large and that's probably down to technical problems. And also the, the, other, the other issue is about the methods because most of these, well, in fact, all of these um, studies use one or maybe a few energy minimized conformers to represent each state. And that is, that, um, is probably a, a serious limitation, especially for the unbound state. Now, uh, now, so now I'm turning to our work where we tried indeed to not take just one or one conformer per state, but replace that by a summarized ensemble using MD and explicit solvent uh, for both the bound and unbound state. And so the aim was to investigate uh, reorganization energies and see if we could see evidence uh, of structural pre-organization for some of the compounds. Uh, so to do that, we, we have a, a selected set of 26 diverse compounds. So that's diverse versus the chemistry and also their range of flexibility and the protein targets to which they bind. So this is, um, and, and also because we, we want to compare to the bound X-ray structure, we need good quality X-ray structures, which by the way, severely restrict the sets that we can compile for that. Uh, this is an issue. So this is just to give you examples of the studied compounds uh, on the left-hand side. So the left hand, the blue numbers on the left-hand side are the number of rotatable bonds in each compound uh, to cover a range of flexibility because some people have suggested that there may be a, a correlation between reorganization energies and the number of rotatable bonds. And I can tell you right, so in our, in our hands, we do not see that, I can say that right now. And we, we tried to include some approved drugs just because it's fun to use. Uh, well, it, we, we, we think it's relevant to look at actual drugs. Uh, so the, yeah, as part of compiling this, this set, this test set, if you like, we wanted to make sure that we, we would only include X-ray structures of good quality for the compounds. And that is not trivial because um, compounds are modeled far less well in the electron densities than standard biopolymers in general. So we, of course, when as to, we select systems for which the crystallographic statistics are, are look decent. But we also, every time we check that the, comp, the, the actual compound conformation fits the, the electron density. And you may also notice that most of these compounds look quite extended in their bound state. Um, so for, um, although there are exceptions, but frequently they look quite extended making, because they make int extensive interactions with a protein. So now um, I'm going back to how we, uh, we represented or how, how, how we approach um, the bounce, the unbound state, sorry, starting from basics. And this is, okay, this slide will come across as quite trivial to the electrostatic community, but 
the simplest thing one can do to represent the unbound state, as I say, is to use a global energy minimum. And uh, you can opt the, the, even the, the crudest thing you can do is generate the conformers in vacuo, which has been done by some studies and is still done by some studies. And of course, if you do that in vacuo, what you get is severely collapsed conformers under electrostatics and van der Waals interactions. Um, so there are, some, there are some almost comical examples on this slide, such as methotrexate and atorvastatine. So you can see these compounds are very collapsed under what is, uh, one can say very or quickly, uh, spurious interactions, right? Uh, and I, I sh as, as, when I show that to my uh, medicinal chemist colleagues, they, they are not familiar with that, you see, and yet they are asked to do some modeling themselves. So now um, if, so this, this, is, this collapse is a very severe artifact um, and, uh, and it persists, of course, if one neutralizes the title of ball group. So, just neutralizing uh, the, two, the, the ionic groups does not get rid of, of this artifact. And this happens for all kinds of compounds. Um, some, pe some people, a, a, short, a possible shortcut is to simply turn off the electrostatics when you generate the, the, comp the conformers, but you run, one runs into other problems with that. So, Okay, so the next uh, the next thing to try is to generate the conformers with a continuum solvation model, and so we tried uh, the first uh, generalized Born solvation model that we have access to in macro, with a program macro model, and that's the, the OPS two thousand and five force field. Um, and this does improve things for some compounds. So for instance, these three compounds, which were severely collapsed in vacuo now are, are, are I would say no longer collapsed. They present their polar moieties to the solvent. So that looks much better. However, uh, most compounds remain collapsed with um, this generalized bond solvation model. Um, so I should say this is maybe uh, my justification for presenting to this webinar series is a little bit, the solvation models hopefully count as a little bit of electrostatics. So uh, hopefully th that will be, uh, this presentation is acceptable in that sense. Now we tried, so we tried another more modern generalized born uh, model uh, from, so with a different force field, different software, and we found very similar results as to what we had with the first generalized bone solvation model. So the same three compounds um, looked much better. They are no longer collapsed, but uh, more many other compounds are still quite collapsed with what we would say are spurious intramolecular uh, polar interactions. And of course, the, so we think that uh, these methods is frequently give you a poor representation of the unbound state. And of course, what happens is that these, these spurious intramolecular interactions artificially lower the energy of your global energy minimum. Uh, so if you use that to calculate reorganization energies, um, you are in this situation so where the global minimum is a poor representation of the unbound state because it is collapsed with spurious intramolecular interactions so we uh, we artificially lower this energy state which in terms overestimates the reorganization energy and we thought this was probably one of the major reasons why such large organization energies have been uh, found before. And we think that's, that's partly correct, but probably not the whole story. So instead, we wanted to generate the conformers with uh, MD simulations in the unbound and bound state. 
And for that, we use what we have access to, which is a program Desmond with uh, the OPLS 2005 force field. So there are, of course, all kinds of questions about the force field. Um, the unbound state was uh, um, simulated um, between half a microsecond and a microsecond. For the bound state, we could only do um, 100, 100 nanoseconds because we have 26 systems. But what is important is that in the unbound, the simulations for the unbound state were not started from the X-ray structure. Instead, they were started from um, the global energy minimum obtained with the first generalized bone solvation model. So one can also, one can then compare um, uh, what the generalized bone solvation model gives to, um, to the MD simulations. Um, so I, this slide is just to say that the compounds in the unbound state were, I would say, fairly sampled during the MD simulations. So this is shown pictorially where uh, for every compound, we overlaid the, the conformers on a moiety, a ring of this, conf of this compound, and you can see the, substitu the, the substituent cover a fair amount of of um, conformations. So the, 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 the MD simulations were not confined to the starting conformer. Um, and now here is what we, the kind of things that we, we obtain. So on the left-hand side the panel, I, I show the most populated cluster from MD for some example compounds. And you can see, so this is of course obtaining with explicit solvent. And now these, compo these compounds are no longer collapsed, of course, because they, they interact directly with explicit water. Uh, so for instance, methotrexate or lisinopril or atorvastatin are nicely extended and they are devoid of uh, obviously spurious intramolecular interactions. Now, uh, one, the right-hand side panel looks at the distribution of uh, radii of gy gyration for the conformers obtained uh, either from MD, MD is a red trace, also generalized bond solvation model, which are blue and green and vacuo is, is black. I should say this is not a truly fair one-to-one -one comparison because we have not run MD with a generalized bond solvation model, but this is still, this is a practically, let's say relevant comparison in terms of what tends to be done. Um, so, and what, so what we see is that indeed uh, the compounds simulated with MD with a red trace tend to have larger radii of gyration. So they are more extended than what is obtained with a collection of conformers generated with generalized Born solvation model. Uh, lisinopril is a very interesting compound. Uh, we will see it again. And it, is also, it also illustrates the fact that in explicit solvent MD, it is a lot more extended than with other approaches. But this is not always the case. So melagatran uh, at the bottom of the slide um, has a different behavior, which also which suggests that if you are really interested in a particular compound, of course, the experiment has to be run explicitly. Now, um, we, we, we wanted to see if, this, if there was uh, evidence of pre-organization uh, for, for the, the, the unbound compounds compared to their X-ray structure. So for that, we simply, so to, 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 to look at this possible similarity, we simply looked at the root mean square deviation the percent of the time that the compounds spend in the unbound state within two angstrom of the X-ray structure. And we, we did find that some of these compounds, in fact, did, uh, although the simulations were not started from the X-ray structure, some of these compounds do spend a lot of time 
in, in conformations which are similar to the X-ray structure. Uh, so with various uh, amount of time. So uh, although the compound set was not at all um, compiled uh, for that or uh, was not, I would say, biased by that, we do find some evidence for pre-organization in the unbound state. But what we were really interested in was uh, an estimate of these intramolecular reorganization energies from the simulations. And the way we do it is very simple. We, we calculate the intramolecular conformational energy, uh, of course, based on the force field. Um, and we, we average it in the unbound state. We average it for the bound state, and we take the difference. Um, and because this is maybe a little bit, uh, well, this, this, this is, we, we call it a delta H, one, one can argue about that, but um, it's I suppose to emphasize the fact that these are now averages obtained in uh, more physic physically plausible conditions. And here's what we get. Um, and so here on, on the Y axis, we have this reorganization energy, and the x-axis are the 26 compounds. Um, this, it goes to 27, but it's in fact 26 compounds um, plotted by uh, increasing reorganization energies. So the first and main thing to say is that in our hand, we do find relatively moderate uh, reorganization energies on the whole with a median of less than 3 kcal per mole and a mean of 5 kcal per mole. But still, to, and that is to our surprise, we still found uh, at least three compounds with organization energies uh, of 15 kcal per mole or above. Uh, and this came as a surprise to us. Um, and you can see they are very polar compounds. And in fact, and this is again maybe why this is part of the, the notes about electrostatics in this work, uh, these, these large organization energies are dominated by the electrostatic component in the force field. Uh, so, so, uh, is there, so we haven't fully, we haven't yet fully understood it and we don't really know yet what to, truly think of that, but here are some thoughts. Uh, and it, in fact, it would be really good to have, um, to have comments and feedback from, from uh, people who are listening. Um, so we, we saw, so taking the example of lisinopril, we saw that uh, the global energy minimum with a generalized bond solvation model had this uh, intramolecular ionic ion pair. If we put that into the solvated MD and look at the distance between these two groups, uh, this, the dis so these interactions is disrupted most of the time, as you would expect in explicit solvent. However, it is it remains formed part of the time. So there's a residual intramolecular ionic pair formed even in explicit solvent. And we think this, in fact, may well contribute to this to the corresponding large organization energies and its electrostatic component. Uh, and melagatran is even more extreme in that respect. So it's it will be the same story uh, when we put the the conformers from the generalized bond solvation model into the MD. The, the ionic pair is, disrupt, is frequently disrupted as judged by the distance between these two groups. However, it is still frequently formed to our surprise. And it's not totally down to the, this little ring in the middle. So we think that, um, so, but the next, the, the other, the counterpart to that is that if you look at, um, the bound state of these compounds, and here I'm only showing the X-ray structures. There is no, in, so for instance, we can look at lisinopril on top right uh, hand side. There is no intramolecular 
polar interaction left uh, because all the polar interactions are formed between the compound and the protein. And it is essentially the same for melagatran as well. So it is possible that uh, these large, so the question is whether these, very la these large organization energies are artifactual or not. And if they are not artifactual, how can they be rationalized? And it is possible, uh, although we are very unsure, um, it is possible that these large organization energies uh, are, are in fact reflect to some degree at least the fact that we have some remaining intramolecular, uh, very strong polar interactions in the unbound state, even in explicit solvent, while these, um, these intramolecular interactions are uh, fully disrupted in the bound state or so that's, and, and we, this is really a question for still for us, um, the community or the people who do this kind of studies um, are very skeptical about that because again, because uh, the obtainer organization energies seem to be too large to many people. Now time for me to conclude. Um, I, so, uh, the, uh, in general, the characterization of the unbound state uh, for compounds uh, for drug discovery has been neglected. Uh, very little is known, in fact, about that. Nowadays, it can be addressed by MD simulations in explicit solvent, uh, and of course, that will yield a lot of very interesting information. We think that the sampling for small molecules in the unbound state is now reasonable. It's not fully solved, but it, in practice, it's pretty good. Um, and that's thanks to the GPUs. Of However, so the main issue remains the accuracy of the force fields, um, which is very difficult to assess for properties uh, in solution in explicit solvent. We have very little experimental reference data to compare to. And of course, there are also issues with protonation state and totomers. I should say we have not done at all a constant pH simulation. We just go with a more likely, the, 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 the standard um, protonation states and we keep them during the simulations. But these kind of things will have many, uh, there are many areas for application pharmacophore, um, such as pharmacophore modeling, membrane permeability, and of course, target recognition. We have found uh, some evidence supporting pre-organization for, for the compound in this set. Of course, it would be more interesting to work with a series where this pre-organization would make a difference or not <laughs> on the binding affinities, but that's for another day. Um, and based on this set of compounds, we didn't find any simple rule. So one has to do it, I would probably explicitly. Now, re regarding the reorganization energies, um, and I stress it, um, they are mostly in, in this study in the low to moderate range, but everybody, on, concentrate on the three or four very large reorganization energies. Uh, and that's where most of the discussion is. We don't know if these large reorganization energies are, are very artifactual or not. Many people think they are, but they could also maybe correspond to a true redistribution of electrostatic interactions from unbound to bound upon binding. So that's, that was my bit. Um, thanks for your time and for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. I see there are already um, questions uh, all along. So <laughs> Thomas, I think is the first one. Thomas Simonson. Uh, then, okay, maybe his connection is uh, having problems. Wei, you may want to go. Okay, so the so interesting talk. 
Right. I, there's two things I want to uh, once comment. It's about the reorganization energy. I think your definition of reorganization energy is different from the, the classical definition of reorganization energy. So classical reorganization energy is indeed a free energy. It's not energy, right? And so the in your case, right, and it's based on the classical definition of reorganization energy. In your case, the way to estimate reorganization energy is actually indeed can be very straightforward. You have the information already. You show actually there's a 15%. If you say there's a 15% of the confirmation, solution confirmation is similar to your bond confirmation. You just take you just take the RT log that probability. That's your reorganization energy. Based on your observation, it's a very small value, like sub k couple more. Right. And so because actually the gas phase energy has almost no real physical meaning in a certain way. It's just some way you can de decompose. That's the number one common. Number two common is really relevant to why your, your particular observation of the, the gas phase energy, you call the relative energy is so large because actually that's called the compensating effect. So the, the, that's pretty common, right? And so when in the, in the, in the high dielectric environment or in a strong intention in a strong electrostatic intention environment, your in molecular internal energy and then the, mo the molecule in intention with the environment, they compensate. One go up, one go down. It's a large, although you see a large value, but they compensate very, very strongly. So we have a quite a bit of study in the community, including myself, right? And so that, that's why you see large value if you only measure the gas phase, the difference, right? So my true question, this is right now come to my question. Right, and so the I think the, the key part is the the meaning of this number, right? And you you try to you try to uh, look into this number, right? Questions: What's the true meaning of this number? Um, and what, what, what 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 can you learn from this number? On, on the other hand, yes. So thanks for your comments. Um, I I think uh, your comment about as a free energy. Um, is probably very um, is very relevant, and you are you are in fact not the first person to to say that. So uh, we we agree with that. But um, I sh although I should say, uh, of, you know, the the studies of previous studies in this field um, have unfortunately uh, have been have only been able to. A concentrate on the component, the intramolecular component. That's because in, it's not so. It and and that is so. One reason for that is that is because it is potentially seen as a practical handle on which to to act when you design compounds. Uh, getting statistics, you know, on. 50% uh, uh, look like that, you know, look like the bound state in the unbound state. That, that, is, that is nice in terms of maybe pure physical chemistry, but it doesn't help you design compounds, I think. So when you, when you try to improve binding, you need some insights uh, on uh, the contributions. So the, I would agree that the numbers that we calculate is probably, is probably not um, maybe the best theoretically, although, the, you know, but, but it, is, it, is, um, it is still uh, something which is seen. So the meaning of it is that hopefully we can get some insights into uh, what favors binding or not, um, and so this is probably not this is not perfect, but um, but I don't think it is meaningless in that sense. Um, um, and and so I would be so I don't know I would be interested to have. Um, so when you say you calculated reorganization and you you also look at reorganization energies. Is it with, with what kind of systems is that? Uh, no, no, no. I should. I, I said. I should. The. I said. In terms. That's in my co second comment, right? Regarding the the compensation 
compensating effect between the intramolecular intention and the intermolecular intention, right? You look into the inter intramolecular intention, but indeed that, that particular number, that's always true. When you look at a, a, a component of uh, a component of the, the molecule, right? And so the energetic component molecule in the solve actually the is not very meaningful because actually that's a large compensating effect with the other component of energy, right? In that actually, we, we did look into that before, right? And so the, uh, regarding real energy, right? My comment was actually the, your definition is different from the classical definition of real energy. That's, that's my, my comment, right? Yeah. And so the classical real energy is free energy, right? Just in your case, it's a, just, just RT log, the probability. Right, yeah, I, I suppose, um, no, it, it's a very interesting comment. I think that, that will help us think about it. Um, of course, you know, what is classical depends a little bit on your point of view. So, uh, uh, um, I, but... sorry, actually, I, not my point of view. <laughs> I, based on my, my teaching of textbook, physical chemistry, thermodynamics. Right. <laughs> Which is which is also uh, ultimately my preferred reference. So I think you are probably right on that. Um, but you see, for instance, we have uh, we we uh, we are also informed by the previous studies on this topic, uh, which indeed um, used a definition, the same def definition as the one we used. So. Um, in that, so that this is where what is classical becomes a little bit uh, more vague. But I think you are probably ultimately correct uh, um, uh, on that. So yes, RT log of the population. Uh, but but as I said, RT log of the population unfortunately doesn't. Although it is nice from a theoretical point of view, it doesn't help you much when you talk to medicinal chemists and try to help them uh, design better compounds. So this is where some kind of um, compromise need to be, to be found, I think. Yeah. Walter, can I come in? I, I see a question from Thomas. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Nicola, good to see you. Um, Good to I see you, have Thomas. Two questions. Yeah. I have two questions, which are both a little bit technical. The first one is that you didn't really tr talk about dispersion interactions between the solute and the solvent. And so obviously, if you have a GB implicit solvent, it doesn't give you the attractive dispersion between the solute and the solvent. And by leaving that out, that will push you towards collapsed conformations. I mean, not as much as in vacuum, but it will still push you towards collapse conformation. So there's some pretty good implicit models out there for dispersion. And I just wonder if you tried any of them. And the, 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 the reverse aspect is that in the explicit solvent, you know, very hard in experiments, but in simulations, it's very easy to remove the attractive dispersion. In that case, you should also uh, get collapsed confirmation. So I don't know if that's something you thought about that. So that was just my first question. I, my second question is very short. Maybe <laughs> hopefully I can squeeze it in after you had a chance to respond. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, um, uh, so your first question about uh, the GB models uh, and the fact that uh, yes, there's no dispersion uh, and, and indeed, uh, um, so we haven't tried any any other uh, GB models. And if you have suggestions, uh, I think we, we would be happy to learn. Um, and and f we 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 are very limited with the things that we have access to. Um, but right. still, we would like to know what exists and what you know what mm -hmm. would be possible. Um, uh, so, so I think you are saying that there are better GB models which uh, would give a better representation of of the solvation in terms of um, yes, ha having including some dispersion terms. Is it is it what you are saying? Right, right. I, I actually would not call it a GB model. I, mean, I would combine the GB model on the one hand and a separate dispersion 
contribution on the other in the same spirit as a GBSA type model where you, you know, your, your hope is that the SA part can come in and give you dispersion, but there's some better models. Right. Um, is it, but, but then would you, would you apply this, this, can you apply this dispersion term while generating the conformers or is it? Yes. Yes. Right. Sure. Okay. You can do MD. And then my second question is, um, it seems to me that nowadays it would not be too expensive to actually run, you know, you run your explicit solvent MD. Nowadays, it probably would not be too expensive to use metadynamics and actually get out a, a, a free energy surface for the conformational degrees of freedom. Now, I, I don't actually know the cost, but I'm guessing you could do at least a ligand a day. I wonder if you, with something like Gromax, I wonder if you thought about that. Yeah, we th we thought about that. It's I think you are I think the 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 cost, the computational cost, will probably uh, be affordable uh, depending on how well equipped you are. So currently, I think this is to, this is still out of reach for us. Uh, but I think it will. Uh, I, I think it is feasible um, mm -hmm. if if you are you know well equipped and in the, so so. Um, so I think that's, and I think there are some people at Boehringer Hingelheim, in fact, which have done it on a very small number of compounds. Um, so yes, it's, um, I, I, so I, I don't have experience with that, but so mm -hmm. I think it's a good, is it something that you have contemplated trying or? Yeah, but we've not actually, uh, for peptides actually, for small peptides, right. I think it's the same okay. problem. Well, Thank I you, think that's, that, yeah. No, thanks a lot for your comments. Um, I would be interested to know, how, so how did it work for the peptides? Was that helpful or? Uh, no, we didn't have a chance to do it. I was wondering if you had done like a pilot study. Probably there are people in the room have done it. Um, right. Okay. But, yeah. The issue, the issue for metadynamics, actually, you have to defend some other parameter. I don't know for the molecule you want to sample the conformation, which other parameter you you define. And so the that's the issue, right? And the, right. Metadynamic you know, the smaller quality. ones, the smaller ones, if you have you know five or six dihedral angles, it probably. Oh, that's beyond the metadynamics, right? And then so the most these techniques actually the, the that's the limit of number of degrees freedom you use simultaneously. If you and do. here, it, uh, okay. Okay. I, I would use, I mean, something like rest or something, right? It's not, mm -hmm. because you're not, all you're trying to find is different basins, right? Yeah. Well, no, metadynamics, you would actually, you know, get the, the weights of the basins. No, no, that, that's right. But, but, but then you need, like, like, like Wei said, you need, uh, it could be a linear combination of the, of the torsions or something, but, but uh, right. like five, six torsions as independent, it's too much for metadynamics. Okay, right. thanks. Yeah. Like you'll be on the limit. But even RAS has a limitation too, because RAS actually be. Oh, sure, sure. Like yeah. RAS actually doesn't sample water, water intention well. So the, right. Yeah, there's, yeah, you can try. Yeah, you can yeah. try. Mm -hmm. Just, can I ask Walter my question? Yeah, or anybody else? No? You're muted, Walter. But yes, uh, Adrian, go ahead. Thanks. So first, way yeah, reorganization energy is, is free energy, but that's that's a problem with the people that define it, right? They they forgot to say organization free energy, right? I mean, there, there is such a thing as organization entalpy, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Or but you know, the, internal energy, right? Right. Even even Rudy Marcus, he he, he still called that energy, not a free energy. But everybody no, knows that right. free energy, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but but. Uh, uh, so Nicholas, in the in the chat, I put uh, the reference oh. that I use for this uh, for this problem, which is from uh, Xavi Barril in Barcelona, right? Uh, can you find it? Yeah. Uh, I uh, I you will try to. Yes, okay. um, uh, I'm sure that. Um, uh, so maybe I can also, or if I yeah, always yeah, I can see the chat. Okay. Yes. Um, so, so is that, it just a definition? No, no, no. So, so, so is that... No, in, in, so in that paper, they're trying to do exactly what you're trying to do, but it's, um, but essentially what they use is, is quantum mechanics, right? So they, they do sampling of the conformations with classical, and then they really do quantum, so they get away from the force field issue, right? 
Oh yeah, at... is it so? Is it is it as I I know their work a little bit. Is it a recent study or an old no, this study? No, one is two thousand and eight or nine or something. Or two thousand and nine, I think. Oh, I see. Yes, I. It have I... some newer stuff, but it's it's basically the same results. Yeah. yeah, I I'm familiar with this study. Yes, um, yeah, okay. I don't think that. Yeah, I'm not sure that really. I mean, I I know Javier well. Um, he's an ex colleague, and um, okay. and I with all due respect, I don't think this, this study really has. I mean, it, okay. it it is nice to do QM. It is nice to do QM, but um, but then you are you are still. I think the issue remains, then that you you only have a small number of uh, well. You, you cannot really look at many conformers and and uh, you know after discussion with people who do QM the, they do also have a collapse issue even if they use a solvation model in combination with a QM so this is really this, strange we do we do this every day day in and day out um, with this yeah um, well, if so, if if you do, um, well, it also depends how you generate your conformers in the first place, sure. um, because if you if you just apply QM on conformers generated with force field, or then you will find severe collapse issues. Um, so one has to be extremely cautious on that. I think. Yeah. I mean, um, what we do, what we do is we we take we take we first. Uh, allowed the bonds and the angles to to adjust themselves and not the torsions, right? Yes, yes, no, yeah. I the bonds and the angles are the ones that, and then and then we move from there. But but yeah, if we're careful enough, uh, we we've been doing this, you know, literally but, five but to, to six thousand a day, no problem. Right, but to 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 look at which kind of properties, what what is the aim of that? Or literally, the, the the so two things, right? One of them is the penalty to go to the X-ray structure, yeah, from solution. That's one. But the other one is to look at the many many conformations in solution because if my if my colleagues in pharma have told me the right thing. When they try to do docking, right? So you don't have you don't have the dock structure, right? You don't have the the the, the, the uh, biopic structure. But if you try to do docking, you should not even try to dock conformers that are farther than, let's say, ten kcals per mole from the minimum in solution, because that's too much of a penalty, right? If you if you have to if you have to well, that's, that's, conformation yeah. up and then come down, that's never going to be a good try, yeah. right? Just a dynamic. That's in fact, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that's in fact one of the motivation for these right. kind of studies, right. because the the you know the energy the conformational energy penalty that you the, the, uh, that you you can allow yourself to pay in the bound state right. is is currently unknown. So if you have results on that, I think that would be of interest, no, but, but um, even in terms currently of- Currently, I know, but we, yeah. we, know, we know that a really, really, really good binder, right? Should be made, you know, minus 12, minus 13 kcals per mole binder, maybe. Yeah, for, in, for yes, in terms of- that, That's a spectacular yeah, binding binder, free energy, right? yes. In free energy, right. So, and, and, and there's a couple of cases where you can get that without changing conformation from the unbound to the bound state. So I would say that in my head, that's kind of the limit, right? You, we're not gonna get better binders than that anytime soon. Uh, so if you, if you need to, if your organization penalty in solution is five kcals per mole, then you need to go 18 down, right? In the bound state and that's, and, and, and that's I never seen that done, but yeah. Well, that that's I think at the heart of the question. Right. Uh, I, that's where that's it's that's where it is ill characterized. Uh, there's people. There are many people have their own intuitions about it, and uh, there are lots of opinions. Uh, but unfortunately, it is an unresolved question. But we have we have exactly the same intuition as yours. We, when we approached that, we thought that all oh, these large organization energies are probably um, 
mad or they are just a byproduct probably of the limitation of the tools. Yeah, right. But, but remember, the people, who, the people who did that before us were also very careful. They were, you know, they, also, they know what they are doing. They, they use the best tools that they have at their disposal. And they, 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 but nevertheless, they regularly come up with very large reorganization energies, well, potential energies. Um, and, and that is puzzling. Um, no, and... I, I, I agree. I'm just saying that I, I cannot see how that's right, right? I mean, essentially, the only way that's right if your binding energy, your binding free energy is minus 40, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we, I, 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 it, it, is, it is a common reaction to that and we don't i don't think that we have found you know the solution we we don't have a full explanation or even a, uh, we to that i think it is still an unresolved question because although this intuition although your intuition on that may well be think, correct can i can i ask you a question i think it's a, I think it's a thermodynamic it's a simple thermodynamic cycle right if, hmm. if it's bound the free energy of binding has to be negative we agree on we agree on yeah. that statement. Of course, of course. Okay. I, I think we agree. I think we we basically agree. It is but just it's not that, right? It's uh, uh well, I think, I, I, can I follow up with a question? I think that would be a little bit easier to reconcile this uh, conversation. So that if you 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 believe or you feel that there's some sort of a uh, role that play this uh, so-called your uh, real 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 energy in this banding, have you ever correlate? Make a correlation between binding infinity and your real energy, energy you calculated real energy to see if there's any pattern. No, so that's that's a very good question. We we haven't found any pattern, uh, not oh. yet. But the the so we haven't found it. Other authors have not found it. Uh, the although of course the 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 number of compounds are relatively small. But uh, but yes, one in principle one would have to bring into the picture the, the binding, the, the, the affinities, I think, absolutely. Right, and so uh, there's, there's some study regarding the contribution of, of absolute binding of the molecule to the protein. You, know, you can argue, you know, some, of the, some of the decomposition analysis, you can argue whether the pathway is reasonable, like Benoit Rue did before. And so, but actually that there is a sort of consensus. If you talk about absolute uh, contribution, to the binding infinity, the largest part you'll be surprised is the dispersion interaction <laughs> to the binding infinity. It's because because the protein density is different from the water density, and then your your dispersion part has absolute contribution. That's one one way to one way we, we learn. That's another way we learn is actually the regarding the binding infinity, the highest good binder, strong binder. They tend to the reason you tend to have a good, strong binder mostly due to the fact actually you the molecule replace some high energy water in that location, right? That's another thing people know, but I don't know, I don't think that's known for sure, but that's a very, very strong cases to show that's another, right? But very rarely people see actually that the reason you have a strong binding is really due to electrostatics. There's only one case I know is well, very well known due to purely due to electrostatics because binding spark star pretty, pretty binding, but that's a yeah. lot of the charge residue they integrate together. But very rarely to see really charge charge intention contribute very very strong binding for the small molecule. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, but I was not at all arguing that the electrostatics drives binding. Um, but I would agree with. Um, uh, yeah, we are familiar with the things that you mentioned, and uh, um, yeah, that's so. So certainly, these the binding free energies, you know, as many contributions uh, and and in practice it is it, it is not so easy indeed to navigate that um, so the, it my my and this discussion is very helpful to me I mean these discussions um, we I, I think uh, if you talk to people who actually you know who have to design compounds, you will find that the question of the reorganization energy in practice is still open. Um, 
but I, I in fact I, I agree with Adrian. Um, we we don't imagine we we do not think that there should be large reorganization energies. Um, but annoyingly, they keep cropping up in studies. Uh, so why is that? What are we doing wrong? Um, I personally blame the experimentalists, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, the thing we cannot, they cannot help us on that because they only give us, you know, the, the overall binding free energy. Um, so, um, but but yeah, I I um, I'm still intrigued as to um, whether so you know um, the the. So the, the electrostatic interactions for some of these very polar compounds in the bound state must be must be strong, um, but of, as uh, but as we are saying, it is of course compensated by um, the dissolvation and so on. Yeah. So so it getting the getting the, the precise you know net sum of everything. In practice, is very very hard. I think um, at this stage. Yeah. So I don't know if there are other questions. Uh, yes, there is a question on the chat from uh, uh, Thomas Laue, who is asking uh, whether it is possible to compare the calculated radius of gyration with measured value, for example, from neutron scattering. Uh, that's a very interesting question. I don't know. So uh, neutron scattering, I don't know if there are neutron scattering experiments on compounds. Uh, I, I don't, in fact, um, I don't know a lot about neutron scattering. Um, uh, I, so, I mean, who's, could this person maybe elaborate a little or, or maybe um, discuss? I don't know. Uh... Uh, Tom, are you are you there? Yes, yes, I am. Uh, it would be you have you have a value that can be compared to an experiment, the radius of gyration. It would be very useful to have an experimental validation for your calculations. Uh, neutron scattering might be used with a small compound. In principle, you could use solution X-ray scattering as well, but the scattering power of those compounds might be uh, fairly small. Right. Yes. Um, so yes, yeah, so, and and do you think that one could then? Um, so first of all, yes, we would love to have, you know, experimental data to compare to, and if uh, if one could compare to, to the radius of the, the radius of gyration, that would already, that would be very interesting. Um, I never thought about. Uh, Getting those from neutron scattering, but um, uh, I suppose the question, you know, I don't know if people doing neutron scattering would ever consider doing that on small molecules uh, because these seem to be fairly heavy duty experiments. I mean, you need a nuclear receptor, right? And uh, um, yeah, they're not cheap uh, and easy, but it should it should be uh, feasible to do on on. Uh small compounds again x-ray scattering could could also right uh, but would you so what would be probably the you might run into is the solubility of those compounds oh i think most of this this well uh, i don't know how much you would need but um many of these compounds would be soluble uh, uh be, because they, they, are, they are intended to be drugs usually people try to make them fairly soluble um and so what would be the advantage of neutron scattering over X-ray scattering, for instance? I think, uh, I think you stand a better chance with a small molecule like that to get uh, reasonable data. But X-ray scattering would work just fine. It, it's just, you probably would want to talk to someone who does scattering for a living to find out which is the better Right. Thing. Um, well, yes. Yeah, uh, okay, well, then we would have, because usually uh, things are interested in biomolecules and uh, things which change conformations or shape depending on the conditions. So whether we could convince anybody to work with small molecules, but that's a very interesting suggestion. Talk um, to some of the pharmaceutical companies. They they have access to uh, this sort of 
uh, okay. technology. Okay, well, thanks for the comment. Okay, so. So, so actually just on that point, this is Marilyn, would some um, sort of size exclusion chromatography might give you also a, a range of sizes? No, you, 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 well, you can get the, no. you can, not really, you get the, depending on how you run the column, you can get something that's not a Stokes radius, it's not, you could get the Stokes radius on these molecules for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, but now the Stokes radius is going to include the solvation layer, and I'm not sure if mm -hmm. you can add that into your calculation, but those are, it's a readily mm -hmm. measured parameter. Okay, well, um, that is certainly something I will keep in mind. Um, Marilyn, it's nice to, to hear oh, you. Oh, yes. Sorry, <laughs> I, I was a little quiet today, but it was really nice. I haven't, you know, yes, it's great. I was no, yes, very interesting. Oh, well. You need to look at the protonation states of all your molecules and your uh, proteins when they bind. That's another way you can get. Uh, oh, yes. Things. Well, right. Well, we, we will recruit you then. Um, yeah. Uh, is it, yeah, is there, I think Adrian's so... the, the, the one for that. <laughs> yes, there are so many things. Um, I think pH const, uh, constant pH microdynamics um, yeah. would be wonderful, but um, for us, it's still a little bit out of reach, uh, yeah. unfortunately. But um, hopefully, hopefully, yeah, that, that will mm -hmm. come into play at some point. Yeah. Okay. So I do not see any more questions. So I would like to thank again uh, Nicholas for uh, uh, his presentation of today, for letting us see the uh, problems and challenges characterizing the uh, computational chemistry in drug design, which is a very interesting application of uh, what we do. And, and I would like to tell you that next week there will be uh, Thomas Simonson speaking, Ooh. and uh, I will be uh, eager to hear, uh, to see you, uh, back again and to hear from him okay bye bye and thanks thank a lot to thanks for the comments and suggestions yeah. bye -bye. thank you bye bye